Hello and welcome back to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. So today, Nico and I did an amazing interview with Professor Stephen Curry, who's an assistant provost at the Imperial College in London, and he's the chairperson of DORA, the Declaration Research Assessment. So we're going to have a very nice discussion, and this is the first part of our interview with uh, Professor Curry. And we discuss about different topics, especially about his career, about his position, about what DORA is. And if you're interested in learning more about research assessment and the, and the declaration, which is trying to change the way the journal impact factors are being misused, stick with us and listen till the end of this episode and also come back next week where we'll have our next episode. So until then, let's get on with the discussion with Professor Stephen Curry. Dr. Curry, welcome to Offspring Magazine, the podcast. Perhaps as an introduction, could you please uh, introduce yourself and tell us about your current work? Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So my name is Professor Stephen Curry, and I work at Imperial College in London, uh, where I am a professor of structural biology. So I'm mostly a protein crystallographer who's been interested in the structures of um, mostly virus proteins, actually. Um, But most of my time at the moment is spent in my role as assistant provost for equality, diversity and inclusion at the university. So I'm not actually research active anymore. So I'm focusing on my teaching and on promoting equality and inclusion um, at the university. I also have the honor to be chair of the steering group of uh, DORA, the Declaration on Research Assessment. Okay, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Um, So actually, one thing that uh, I'm curious about is this uh, position you uh, have now at uh, Imperial College. So how did you actually transition to um, become this provost, it was called? Uh, Yes, so we have an American model of university governance. So we have a president and a provost. Many other universities have a rector or a vice chancellor is the, the person in charge. And uh, so as an assistant provost, I'm part of the university's leadership team uh, with a particular responsibility for equality, diversity and inclusion. And this is a position that was created uh, in 2017 and um, I applied for it. I was basically looking for a change of direction. I had um, I, I think I felt I had reached a point in my life where I felt I had done enough research um, and I partly because of my various extracurricular activities in writing and thinking about science and having gotten involved in policy work around open access and research assessment and uh, research funding and public engagement, I realized I was much more interested in the business of science and the business of universities than in running my own research lab. Um, which is a non-trivial and, you know, a difficult thing to do. It's a very competitive environment out there, as I'm sure you're you're both well aware. So when the job came up, then I was definitely interested in applying it because, I, you know, one of the things that I'm really interested in is the culture of science and scholarship and universities. I think universities are very important social and cultural institutions, um, and have a really important part to play in society, uh, one of which is to do with social mobility. But um, in the UK, um, I think there's a lot that the universities could still do, and particularly within sciences and engineering and medicine, within the STEM subjects. We know there's an historical exclusion of women, particularly, which persists to this day. I think only about 30% of uh, scientists and engineers across Europe are women, um, and that's obviously too low. And then increasingly, although quite a lot of attention has been paid to gender equality and the challenge of gender equality, increasingly other aspects of equality to do with underrepresentation of uh, people from different ethnic backgrounds, but also thinking about the LGBT uh, community and uh, disabled people and making sure that you know they are able to 
be involved in science and that actually the system um, is open and welcoming of all the, their talents and contributions and because historically uh, they have tended to be excluded because of the particular nature of European history, which I guess we probably don't have time to go into right now. So I think uh, across Europe and in well in the UK particularly, a lot more attention is being paid to this, but across Europe as well. And one of the, I am involved in a number of bodies across Europe that are looking at equality and diversity in European universities too. And it's something that we are more and more mindful of at DORA as well, which we can maybe talk about later. So you just brought us on to our next question, which is you mentioned DORA. And I'm sure a few of us who are in this field who are looking into research assessment are quite well aware of DORA, but for the native listener out there, I'm sure they would like a little explanation on what or who is DORA and what DORA does. Okay. Uh, well, actually, that's probably quite a good way to phrase the question of what or who is DORA. So DORA is basically two things. Uh, the first and original thing that it is, is a declaration. And DORA stands for Declaration on Research Assessment, and it is a statement that was published in 2013, uh, which affirms um, a, a sort of criticism of the overuse and misuse of journal impact factors in research assessment and is trying to promote um, a much more um, holistic and robust and intelligent approach to assessing uh, researchers. And But DORA is also an organization as well now, for the first few years of its existence, it was very much um, an unfunded organization, and it worked out of the back office of the American Society for Cell Biology, which was one of the organizations that helped to bring DORA about. So the, the, the declaration itself came about as an initiative, an initiative of a number of learned societies and, um, and publishers and journal editors um, and funders. Um, um, but now, since 2017, um, we have actually managed to um, secure some funding from a number of supporting organizations, which include funding organizations, but also some uh, learned societies and publishers. And they are listed on our website. There's about um, a dozen or more organizations that contribute to us financially, or one or two contribute in kind, so they give us part of their staff time. So DORA actually currently has um, 1.7 people who work for it um, on, a, on a remunerated basis. So we have a full-time program director who is Dr. Anna Hatch, and she's based in Washington. Um, and we have 20% of the time of Helen Sitar, who works for EMBO and is based in Heidelberg. And also we have, I think, a 50% uh, intern who, um, again, is well, works in America and is based in the Washington office. Uh, we have a steering committee, a steering group, which I chair, uh, which has about a dozen members on it, drawn from our, largely from our supporting organizations. And we also have an advisory board, which has 15 or 16 members, and which was very deliberately set up to have people from all over the world, because we are very mindful that the reform of research assessment has to be a global endeavor. There's no point fixing it in America or in Europe, uh, because in China and in India and in Africa and in South America and everywhere, everybody understands the rules of the game. Um, as they have been formulated. And so th the action to reform it has to be coordinated. So our advisory board has three members from every continent on the globe. Um, and we're actually, we're currently um, looking to revise and reform our governance procedures. We might um, merge the steering committee and the advisory board so that we have one body um, that is overseeing DORA that is truly um, representative of the world um, um, that we are trying to reform. Okay, so how uh, is it to coordinate all of these things? I can imagine that it's quite a, or can give you quite a headache to have like people from all over the world in different time zones uh, and then bringing them together. And I assume like they're all also professors uh, similar to you. And so they don't have a, a lot of time. So does it, is it easy to work together? That's um, it's it's not easy, but it's possible. 
Um, and everybody on the steering committee and on the advisory board currently gives their time voluntarily. They're not are not remunerated for it. Um, you know, Dora is something that people really believe in, and so they are prepared to 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 give up their time to that endeavor. Uh, clearly, uh, you know, we were using Zoom even before COVID nineteen. Okay, and that's the only way you can manage a type of um, global organization. As currently constituted, the steering committee, in fact, is mostly Europeans and North Americans. Um, and so there is a bit of a stretch, but one can have one meeting and everybody can turn up. Uh, the advisory board extends right around the globe, all the way from uh, California to Tokyo, uh, going the long way around. Uh, and so at the moment, they usually the, the times rotate. So sometimes you have to get up really early to attend the meeting. Sometimes it's in the early afternoon and sometimes it's at 10 o'clock at night. We, we try to rotate the pain, shall we say. Uh, once we merge, we will have a slightly longer, a larger group, probably. And what we will do there is probably actually have two meetings on the same day which half the group can attend and then we will you know share recordings it's not ideal but i think it's the only practical way to have um, meetings across uh, all time zones um, but we're committed really to being a, a, a truly global organization and and that's what you have to do when you have that commitment okay yeah that, that sounds sounds nice Okay, so maybe we can now get into what uh, Dora actually proposes. So uh, you mentioned it's a declaration. So what uh, does Dora want to change in the current research assessment to, uh, I would say, improve it? Okay, so Dora is probably best known for being critical of the misuse of journal impact factors in research assessment. And I think everybody, well, particularly in STEM, I think it's less of an issue overtly in some humanities disciplines where people tend not to publish in journals, they publish in books instead. But certainly, and I think particularly in the biomedical sciences, then there is a fixation with impact factors And these are used as a shorthand to determine whether or not your research is any good. And while there is a certain logic to the argument, um, it's based on an assumption that an average indicator, which uh, comes from a journal, and a GIF is just basically an average of the citations of all the papers in a journal for uh, a two-year period, um, is an indicator that's worthwhile for every uh, single paper. And we know from looking at the data that that is not true. Um, and so it is, um, while it is, there is, there's obviously a degree of convenience to it. When we're doing research assessment, we are actually trying to assess individual people and individual pieces of work. And the law of averages falls apart at that point, and it's it's, it's unfair um, in many ways to be using averages in that way. And so, although the the sort of the first um, paragraph of the Dora Declaration is really about you saying do not use impact factors as a proxy for decisions about hiring or promotion or grant funding. Um, the remainder of the declaration is actually a series of positive statements around. Uh, what people should be thinking about doing in order to change and improve their research assessment processes. I mean, research assessment is a very important activity, and it is one that is absolutely unavoidable in a world where there are a finite number of jobs and there's a finite amount of money. You have to try and make, and often the money that is being spent, either on salaries to hire people or on um, grants to fund research, Uh, that is largely derived from the public purse. And so clearly um, the funders which act on behalf of their governments or of charities, they want to be making sure that they are funding the best research and the best people. And so you have to be able to make um, a kind of assessment. But one of the problems with the rise of our fixation on impact factors and other metrics, you know, we have seen Uh, things like university league tables come into play, um, and there is a fixation just on citations generally, that it's the published paper that is seen as the true mark of success. And it is a mark of success, and uh, every researcher is always happy when their paper is accepted and happy again when their paper is cited and, and taken up. But there are many other outputs that are important uh, 
important parts of the scientific and the research and the scholarly endeavor. Um, and some of those would be, you know, real world impact. You know, how much has your work helped to cure a disease, for example? We've seen an awful lot of work, of course, going into the analysis and understanding of COVID-19, the development of vaccines. Uh, a lot of that has happened pre-publication, but it's extremely worthy. Um, and and uh, the chance to have real world impact is something that attracts people to a life in scholarship in the first place, in any case. But the system tends not to reward that so explicitly. And that then means that you get people incentivized to focus on one narrow aspect of uh, scholarly activity, you know, publishing research papers in so-called top journals um, in order to advance their careers. It's a, a rational decision on their part. Uh, it's not a system that anybody designed on purpose, but it's a system that we seem to have arrived at that is we under, we know causing um, major problems. It, it slows down the publication of research results because people chase the top journal and then get rejected and then go to the second best journal and get rejected and then go to the next one down in the list. And so they can spend a year or 18 months waiting to publish research that is ready to be published. And that is, uh, to my mind, that is a, an enormous disservice to the public who have a very strong vested interest in this research. We see that during COVID-19, that whole process has been abandoned because people have realized actually the most important thing is to make sure we get a vaccine and that we can put an end to the pandemic. The most important thing is not to publish your results in this or that journal. Uh, and yet we've had to suspend normal operations in order to achieve that. And what that tells you is that normal operations are not working properly. And so it, you know, it is really important to think about the system as a whole. And one of the other products of a healthy system is uh, you know, talented young researchers who are the next generation. And so your effort into teaching undergraduates and then mentoring PhD students and mentoring postdocs, you know, that's an equally important activity. And again, one that is often not a, nobody, you know, little attempt is made to capture or acknowledge or recognize or reward those types of activities. And so what we're calling for is, is for the, the, that breadth and that richness to be recognized. I mean, one thing that I feel is uh, a bit of the the underlying uh, problem there is that um, I mean I think uh, generally the panel members like to do a good job at um, selecting the next I don't know PI position or whatever uh, it is but the problem is that they have limited time so ideally if they had like weeks and months even to look into each person individually like talk to colleagues they had before and so on they could get the best picture possible of who that person is what kind of ideas they have but then i mean just looking at a number if you have like a thousand applicants uh like you want to get rid of i would say 900 first and then look at the 100 in more detail so that's why i i think that this is kind of the dilemma i i I don't know how to solve like the time versus uh, like a uh, depth of uh, yeah, research assessment. Okay. Well, what number would you look at to determine whether somebody is a good mentor of PhD students? I mean, I have no idea. That's the problem. I mean, I think. Uh, it's okay. Well, you raise an important point. It's yes. Uh, so research evaluation, if you want to do it properly, it, it will take time. Okay. It's not an easy thing to do. And in my own experience, you know, recruiting postdocs and hiring PhD students, very, very difficult to to really get to know somebody through that uh, through that process. But I think the the if your if your answer to that problem is to say, well, let's just look at journal impact factors, then I would say that's that's you know that's really not not good enough. And you're right, and Dora is very mindful of this. Uh, and we're not simply suggesting that, well, if you get a CV, then you should read all the papers on the CV. And that way you will really get to know uh, the work that any individual has done. That's not a practical solution because, as you point out, people are very, very busy. It is worth spending some time on it because you are when you're hiring somebody, you're making a very considerable investment. OK, so it is worth spending a, a reasonable amount of time on that process. But I think you also need to then provide the tools for um, creating an application that is 
still concise, but has a lot richer is a lot richer than just looking at a standard CV that lists previous jobs and then the bibliography. And so one of the tools that Dora has been promoting, and we've collaborated with a number of organizations to help develop these, is the narrative CV. And that's a CV that is uh, has a word limit on it, so it's set to be very concise. Uh, but it asks a very specific set of questions, you know, for example, you know, what do you consider to be your major contribution, you know, or tell us about your three or four most important papers and tell us why they're important. You know, tell us about your ability to uh, initiate and sustain collaborations. Tell us about your commitment to open science, you know, tell us about how you have supported your own discipline you know, and tell us about, you know, the, you know, where the PhD students who've been in your lab, what are they doing now? How did you advance their career? And by creating a structured narrative in that way, by asking every candidate the same question, you get information that you can compare from one candidate to the next. Um, by limiting the word count, then um, clearly you're reducing the workload on the assessors, uh, but you're also then providing a narrative um, structure that gives a much greater richness to the information than you would with just a raw set of numbers. Now, it might still be a little bit more difficult to compare, but I think you have to recognize that what you're doing is comparing one human being versus another. And there aren't easy rules. You can have specific criteria and capabilities that you want to meet. And if you define your job description well enough, then that can help too. But I think we have to admit there is no objective way of arriving at a decision. This is not something that you can boil down to an algorithm that you can feed into an AI system that will then make the decision for you. You know, we're talking about an extraordinarily complex set of activities. And while scoring mechanisms are useful for sports, OK, so in the Bundesliga or in the Premier League, I don't think anybody has really got fundamental arguments about, you know, three points for a win, one point for a draw and no points for for losing. OK, everybody understands the rules. OK, you might tweak it. I don't know if you're old enough. It used to be only two points for a win uh, and it was changed about 20 years ago. So um, but um, in order to promote more attacking football, supposedly. But there you go. But. But, you know, football is a beautiful game uh, and has many complexities and subtleties, but is as nothing compared to, you know, research and scholarship and just the vast array of different things that we expect a modern day academic to do. And the idea that you can assign a number to each of those activities and then just add up the numbers and see who's best is a fiction. And it is just not something that we could support. It would be inhuman to do it. Thanks. I think this is a good uh, good way of basically um, balancing, uh, like minimizing the time, uh, especially with this new CV you were describing, minimizing the time people have to spend on the research assessment versus still getting as much information out from the applicants. So, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I like this idea. Yeah, well, there are a number of funders in Europe uh, and in the United States who are already experimenting and using this type of uh, approach. So in Ireland, in the UK, they're going to adopt it. Um, and in the Netherlands as well, uh, uh, there have been experiments and in Switzerland, too. I know the uh, the Swiss National Science Foundation is is experimenting with it, too. So I think it's it's a format that it will evolve. It, there may be problems with it. And I know that there are some criticisms that you might be rewarding someone who's a slightly better writer or who's a better salesperson. Um, there's concerns about bias in the way that men maybe write a little more self-promotingly about themselves than women tend to do. And one has to wor worry about that. So there are, you know, it's not, It's not an, uh, an uh, you know, not a problem-free solution. So there are aspects of it that one has to watch. But there's a, what's interesting is there's lots of experiments going on, and they are being evaluated. So I think I hope we will converge on, uh, you know, good formats that then can be adopted more widely. Okay, that sounds great. So this actually makes me think about the conversation from the other perspective. So for example, when Dora is trying to approach different stakeholders, so what do the people in the publishing sphere or what do publishers say about Dora? Because it's it's kind of uh, taking a bit of what they conceive as their, let's say, publishing hierarchy away from them. 
Well, I think so many publishers do have a pretty sensible attitude towards um, metrics and how they should or should not be used. Um, I mean, for them, you know, the journal impact factor is a is a marketing tool. OK, um, and if their journal has a high impact factor, then they think they will attract all um, they will attract authors to submit to them and they will attract subscribers who will buy buy the journal. OK, I mean, it was originally created as a tool for university libraries uh, because they could then see, well, who was, you know, where were the journals that were the papers that were being cited? And so uh, given that library budgets are finite, it was invented as a tool by librarians to, to measure one journal against the other. There was no idea at the beginning that it would then be used to measure researchers themselves. And it's that, that repurposing of it that has caused um, so many problems. But many publishers are signatories of DORA. And in fact, many publishers um, and learning societies who have publishing arms um, are actually founders of DORA. I wasn't involved in it right at the beginning, um, but it was the American Society of Cell Biology, the EMBO, the European Molecular Biology Organization, and their publishing arm um, that was very sort of uh, in involved in it um, right at the beginning because they recognized that you know this metric that they used was being um, was being widely misused and quite a number of uh, so some publishers are supporters of Dora so they um, provide us with some financial support um, and quite a number of publishers and even some of the very largest ones like Springer Nature like Elsevier, like Taylor and Francis, are signatories of Dora now. now. It has taken a little while for some of them to come on board, but I think they recognize that uh, this is the direction of travel for the research community. And um, um, so I think um, it, it shows you that it's, a, it's an argument um, that, well, I wouldn't say it has been won, but it's an argument that people can see the power of the argument. And the, the problem now is to figure out, as we've just been discussing, how you actually go about implementing it uh, without creating a sort of an enormous uh, um, um, piece of work for yourself. But uh, again, as we discussed, there are tools and procedures emerging and there's an awful lot of interesting work going on in this uh, in this space. I mean, maybe this is the right point now to switch to the, the current progress of Dora. So uh, you mentioned Dora was uh, published in 2013. So, and I think I recently saw that there was this roadmap, which was also published. Uh, and I think the duration for this roadmap already ended by now. Uh, uh, yes. Yeah, so, so the roadmap um, was a roadmap for Dora. It was uh, basically to give ourselves a set of priorities for a two to three year period. We're currently in the process of revising our strategic plan. So we will come up with a new roadmap. It might not look very differently from the old one, but our previous one had three um, main aims. One was to increase the number of signatories. One was to um, increase the, um, uh, sorry, to uh, be proactive about seeking out good practice and helping to develop good practice. And then the third one was about expanding the um, disciplinary and geographical reach um, of DORA. And so uh, we have made progress on all three, I would say. The first one about gaining signatories is really about, you know, uh, um, um, spreading the word about DORA. Um, and, and, and an individual or an organization signing up, that's often very just just the first step because we really do want to make sure and want to see, you know, what does that mean for the, and particularly for organizations that sign DORA, we want to see, you know, why have they signed and what, what will it mean for their um, staff and students if they are a university or if they're a funder, how will they go about changing the way that they assess um, um, funding applications, for example. Um, in terms of the geographical reach, we've done that by forming the advisory board, and we've, we've, we're now much more active in many more parts of the world. Disciplinary reach, um, there's been perhaps less progress there, but, there's a, um, um, but there are other initiatives that we are um, in contact with and happy to support, such as the, um, there's a, an initiative called Humetrics HSS, which is uh, Metrics for the Humanities, HSS is the Humanities and Social Sciences, which is a, it's a US-led initiative, but it's basically trying to ensure that 
um, um, research assessment or scholarship assessment in the humanities and the social sciences, where there's a lot less emphasis on, pub on publishing in journals, um, uh, it, it undergoes the same process of reforming how they do research assessment. So, um, so, um, so we have made progress on all three fronts, I would say. Um, but and that is thanks to the fact that we actually have now a permanent staff. So there's the level of activity has gone up enormously since 2017, thanks to the, the fact that we have some real money behind us. And even with just a very small staff, we think we have a very big footprint and we achieve a lot also by uh, being very collaborative in our approach. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a question concerning your second goal. So let's say some university is interested in implementing the uh, the rules that Dora um, um, suggests. And now how do you support them? Like, how does this usually work out? Um, like they say, okay, I'd like, we'd like to do this. And how, how, do, what, how, do, we how do we proceed now? Sorry. Okay. Well, I mean, there's a number of different ways. Often, you know, it's enough to let them get on and do it themselves. And so some of them will set up a little working party to figure out, well, what does it mean for how we're going to change the way that we write adverts, the way that we write our criteria for promotion and for hiring. Um, and they consult with their community because it is a big change and it is something that is very unsettling for researchers because if, if they've played the game one way and then their university is changing the rules, then that can be... You know, that can cause a lot of anxiety. And so it's important to involve them. Uh, we will, we're happy to be consulted on it, but our capacity for that is obviously a, a little bit limited. But so either our program director or myself or other members of the steering group, um, we can, you know, we'll talk to people on the phone. We go and give talks. Um, I have helped to run workshops um, at various places as well. Uh, we publish quite a lot of uh, work uh, and we've organized workshops at uh, other scientific meetings to discuss research assessment um, and we a couple of years ago we held a meeting in the united states jointly with the howard hughes medical institute uh, to try and identify um, you know what are the real barriers to cultural change around research assessment within institutions particularly within um, universities um, we held it in the States because actually, if you look at the list of DORA signatories, there are very, relatively few yeah, American universities have signed up. OK, now that's not to say that they aren't interested in research assessment. They very definitely are. Um, but I think there is slightly a perception there that uh, the obsession with metrics is a more European thing than an American thing. Um, but even so, I think that we did identify lots of common themes about, you know, the things that people wanted to do to, to broaden out the measures of, uh, you know, what quality research looks like, to think about impacts, but also to think about equity and diversity as well. And so, and so we we wrote that up, and that was published in eLife um, um, last year. And we've also then developed a number of different tools. Again, working with people, um, sort of um, people who think about um, systems and how you actually get change with, you know, within organizations, which is a complicated process. It's a very human process. And so on our website, which was revamped in December, we publish all of these resources. And another thing that we have done, started doing recently is, and we did this in collaboration with the European Universities Association and Spark Europe was we collected a series of 10 case studies of um, mostly universities who had signed DORA and then they told us the story of how they had gone about implementing it and you know what were the obstacles they encountered and so that information is now on the website for others to use so so again you know we have really put an emphasis on you know it's not just about waving a stick at people and saying no 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 you mustn't use the impact factor we're very much um, invested in, you know, building the roads to a better practice. All right. With that, we've come to the end of the first part of our discussion with Professor Curry. Stick with us and we'll be right back with you within a week where we're going to discuss with him a little more on some of these topics and talk about Max Planck Society's involvement with DORA as well. And keep in mind that these are all our personal views. And uh, stay tuned and we'll be right back within a week and before you know it. Off the Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD in the Science Communication Working Group on Off the Magazine. The intro outro music is composed by Shana Trampuma and the pre-intro jingles composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. 
Uh, Off Street Magazine is hosted by Shantra Akmar, Nikolai Horman, Alison Lewis, Adrian Dahoya, Sandra Fendel, and Beatrice Landsbergen. And with that, see you next week.